Hello, my name is Dr. Kate Truitt. I'm here with Rebecca, who hopefully everybody's getting to know very well by now. She's one of our clinical associates. And while she's an expert in anxiety, she does an amazing amount of work with high, highly sensitive people. She's also the lead of our neurofeedback program. And we've been talking a lot about this phenomena, Zoom brain, also just what it is like to be living in a world where our brain is functioning differently. And I don't know about you, but my brain feels very different these days. Mm -hmm. And for me, it's almost like it's taking extra time for my brain to catch up with itself. Yeah. Or it even, it even also feels sometimes like it's harder for me to remember some of the stuff that I read or that I learn. Is that, what do you think about that? I, I think that's normal for a lot of us. I mean, we're, we've been living in a very 2D world of video of just lack of 3D interaction with other humans. Our brains are designed to navigate the world in a 3D, even 4D way. And in a way that helps us stay sharper. Mm -hmm. And instead we're trying to make sense of the world in a 2D, 2D manner. And especially if people are doing a lot of Zoom screen time or Google Hangouts or whatever your version of this new virtual world is, our brain's having to microprocess tons of data all at one time. And think about if you're in a meeting in person, you would shift your focus to one person and you'd be reading all their cues, their tones, their facial expression, and then somebody else would chime in and you'd shift your attention to that person. But then imagine when we're in a Zoom meeting, mm -hmm. we're looking at a grid of people and trying to microprocess all of their expressions and their tones and their experiences and mind read even what's happening for each of them as data is being shared. Right. So taxing for the system and our brains only designed to work with X amount of data at any given time. Right. What you said about having to do all that extra work of microprocessing makes a lot of sense based on what I know about the brain. So the more that we have to hyper focus and, and really use that amazing thinking brain that we have as humans, that takes a ton of energy for our brain to actually create the, the brain waves that allow us to focus. They're called beta waves, right? They're very small, but have a ton of power packed into them. So speaking to that, that would make a lot of sense if our brains are having to use those really high energy brainwave states just to sit in a chair and have a conversation. No wonder lots of us are more fatigued mm -hmm. and our brains feel foggy. That makes a lot of sense. Well, I feel like our brain's kind of going, what the heck, guys? <laughs> like, this is really hard work. Can we get off the treadmill? Yeah. And then, and then we throw in the additional experience of increased stress of our little amygdala kicking up a lot of dust on a day-to-day -day basis based on news reports, what's going on politically, social justice movements, health and well-being of ourselves and others. Yeah. And you, know, you can speak to that especially in your area of expertise with the neurofeedback, what happens when our amygdala starts running the show? Oh my goodness. I mean, our survival brain is powerful and it does its job for a reason. It's more important to survive, to keep breathing, to know what's going on in our world than it is to solve complex math problems, mm -hmm. right? When our amygdala takes over the show, more energy gets funneled to those survival systems, those deep parts of our brain that are focusing on keeping us alive. And if that's getting a lot of the power and then we're also trying to shove power up here, mm -hmm. wow. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, I'm, one of the things I've been thinking a lot about Rebecca is the long terms effect of us living in this 2D world with the chronic stress and the uncertainty of what's going on in the world around us. And I know we've seen an incredible and it's amazing rise in the use of people engaging in our neurofeedback training program. How does that help with, if our amygdala is running the show, we've got all this beta, we're trying to think clearly, but for some reason our brain's just going, I can't handle it all. Mm -hmm. Neurofeedback works really well in helping our brain practice balanced and calm brainwave states. So in particular, in, in the time of excess 
screen usage, Zoom brain, even to some degree, what we're, what we're seeing as post-COVID symptoms. When we use brain training to help our brain practice these more calm brainwave states, it can have a ripple effect where our nervous system has a moment to go. Oh, I want that moment. I want more of that. <laughs> <laughs> and brain training can do that in a, in a handy way because it's not, it's not voluntary. Our brain is able to do this on passively on its own with the help of some of the, um, the, the equipment that we use. And it really helps, it really helps our brain kind of step back into that calm space that it's hard to access right now. So the, the training part is if we imagine living in stress is training our brain into being in a stressed out space. And we talk a lot about the amygdala starts running the show mm -hmm. and in a prolonged way. If the amygdala is running the show, we have those fear glasses on and mm -hmm. anxiety, fear, worry becomes our truth. And so brain training then supports the system in creating electrochemically in terms of those brainwave states a balanced truth of we can upregulate when we need to pay attention and microprocess 20 people on a Zoom screen. And then we can downregulate when we're off that phone call and can take that breath that you just modeled for us. Is, is that a fair way to describe what the brain yeah. training does? Yeah, it's it's essentially reminding your, your nervous system that there is another way to be. Mm. There is a way to step back into that calmer space which allows our body to regenerate its energy, to rest, to replenish, and be able to then continue navigating this very new and very complex version of the world that's evolved. I'm curious, because we talk a lot about havening, and I know you're a certified havening practitioner and definitely deep into the brain geekery as me. Um, how does, or what's the difference? Like, why would I do neurofeedback, which I do do it. And I know you're in charge of my brain and my brain deeply thanks you. Why would I do, or why would our listeners say, you know, neurofeedback sounds great. Even if they already have a really solid havening practice mm. or are doing more traditional psychotherapy. That is such a good question. I think of havening as working really well to regulate our, our nervous system in the moment. So especially when there's a trigger that comes up or your amygdala throws up a flare and it's like, oh, I don't like this, right? We have CPR for the amygdala, kind of something to do in that moment to help our brains regulate and our nervous system to, to soothe. With neurofeedback, one of the things, that, one of my goals for, for brain training, anytime I'm working with someone, is to create long-term sustainable change in the brain. So with neurofeedback, we can actually target different areas in someone's brain that are either working too hard or maybe not working hard enough because they're sending their energy somewhere else that needs it, or if the two sides of the brain are, are talking together too much or they can't hear each other. So with brain training, we can be really targeted and how we help that particular brain balance to come to its ideal um, state of being. Now I can speak to being a beneficiary of that, having being a survivor of encephalitis and living with brain damage for gosh, over a decade now. And one of the side effects being cognitive cloudiness, a lack of attentional focus and just driving myself into a well, driven state in order to do the things that I want to do. And, you know, one of the things circling back to COVID, we're hearing a lot of very similar post COVID symptoms that remind me so much of what I was living with after the encephalitis. Encephalitis is a brain virus for our listeners who don't know. Um, and what I've noticed with my own neurofeedback training and what Rebecca's created in the program that she had me design or that she designed for me is to really balance my thinking brain. So all those beta waves she was just talking about are accessible and my intentional capacity has just changed immensely. And now I can create without being exhausted, which is such a gift. So I just would love to encourage our listeners if you're noticing that your brain's feeling a little foggier, especially during um, these times, living in a sustained state of stress does train our brain. It's malleable as we've been talking about. And you know, looking into or doing a consultation about neurofeedback to see if it's a possible fit to help re-regulate your system. 
an incredible, awesome opportunity. Obviously I'm biased. Um, I am a beneficiary of the effect, um, but wow. And just hanging out with Rebecca is always a joy anyway, and you will get to hang out with her. <laughs> One thing to add with that, we are able to do brain training in the home. So mm -hmm. completely done over, over Zoom or FaceTime, Skype, whatever it is, which is another beautiful opportunity in this time. Exactly. Yes. So it's completely safe, socially distanced, being really protective of the mind and body in every single way, and also taking care of the mind and body. Thank you, Rebecca, so much. Um, we, I, I've linked in the show notes here, we have an entire blog that's all about neurofeedback, what it looks like, what it feels like. And so feel free to check out that article if you'd like more information, or like I said, the phone number is linked here at the bottom of this video and go ahead and give, uh, give us a call and schedule that consult. It's, it's amazing stuff. Thank you, Rebecca. I'll talk to you soon.